So good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us for today's Kobe Institute seminar series presentation. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Ben Baventon and I'm a research fellow in the HIV Epidemiology and Prevention Program here at the Kobe Institute. So I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of all the lands that we gather here today um, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And so in my case, that's the Betagul people of the Euro Nation. And I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today, wherever they may be. So just some housekeeping to start off with today. So the format for the seminar today will be that we'll start off with our presentation from um, Aaron, our speaker, followed by a Q&A um, at the end. So to ask a question, you just click on the icon with the speech bubble and the question mark at the top right corner in Teams um, to open the Q&A chat panel. And then when you click on ask a question, um, please remember to write your name because this is, will help us to reference your question and to make answering easier. And you can also write your questions during Aaron's presentation or you can write them at the end, but it's always helpful to have a couple of keen people to do it throughout so we can get going the questions as soon as Aaron's finished speaking. So it's my great pleasure today to introduce Aaron Cogill to speak to us today. Um, Aaron is the Executive Director of the National Association of People with HIV Australia, or NAPWA. And before that, he worked for the NHS in, um, in England on HIV prevention and sexual health. So he has qualifications in law and policy. And so I'm sure as most of you know, NAPWA is one of the Kirby Institute's key community partners, and we really appreciate Aaron taking the time today to speak to us on the topic of going beyond the meaningful involvement of people with HIV in HIV and HIV prevention research. So please welcome Aaron. Thank you. So thank you for that introduction, Ben. Um, my name is Aaron Kogel. Um, today uh, I'm on the lands of the Gadigal people and I'd like to acknowledge them uh, of the Eora Nation and pay my respects to their elders uh, past, present and emerging. Um, so the first thing I want to do today is introduce you to NAPWA and by doing so explain our legitimacy. For those of you who already know us, then I apologise in advance. So NAPWA is the National Association of People with HIV in Australia. We're the peak organisation representing positive people and we're funded by the Commonwealth Government. We began in the late 1980s under a slightly different name, but our vision remains much the same. A world where all people with HIV can reach their full potential free from stigma and discrimination. Our members are organisations of positive people uh, and we have a member in each state and territory. And some of those are well established incorporated organisations like Positive Life New South Wales, Living Positive Victoria and Queensland Positive People. And others are incorporated but unfunded and volunteer based like the Positive Organisation WA and Positive Life South Australia. And others still are more loosely affiliated groups of positive people like those in the Northern Territory, Tasmania and the ACT. And each member's membership is open to all positive people in that state and territory. We also have two networks, the Positive Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Network and the Femme Fatales, the National Network of Women Living with HIV. And we have affiliate and associate members that include Positive Women Victoria, TASCART, Bobby Goldsmith uh, Foundation, EGAT Hope in PNG, Australia Plus in East Timor and Body Positive in New Zealand. And I tell you that by way of sketching out for you an organisation which is connected through our members to HIV positive people across Australasia and a myriad of population groups. While I think that uh, NAPWA, like all of our community organisations and research centres, always needs to be thinking about and doing more to reach out to an increasingly diverse population of positive people, no other organisation can claim to be more nationally representational than NAPWA. Throughout our engagement systems and processes, what starts out as the many, many voices of positive people is discussed and debated, compromised and revised until what emerges is one national voice of positive people in Australia. But our voice is never diffused, rather it's a potent focus on the issues that most impact people with HIV in Australia. So some of you might be aware of terms like MEPA and GEPA. MEPA stands for the Meaningful Involvement of People with HIV. It started out life as GEPA, or the Greater Involvement of People with HIV. And it's a concept that dates back to the Denver Principles in 1983 and the Paris Summit of 1994. And essentially it calls for four things, a recognition of the important contribution that uh, people with HIV make to the HIV response, a space to be created for that participation, that positive people are supported then to fill that space by building their capacity and by creating networks so they can fully participate and the creation of HIV supportive political, 
legal and social environments. And these principles aim to realise right, the rights and responsibilities of people with HIV, including their right to participate in the decision making processes that affect their lives. It's not something that NAPWA enthusiastically supports only because it's the right thing to do, but MEPA really is about enhancing the quality and effectiveness of the response to HIV. People with HIV have directly experienced the factors that make individuals and communities vulnerable to HIV infection. They have first-hand experience of HIV, of HIV stigma, of HIV related illnesses, and they've developed strategies for managing them. So their involvement as equal partners in program development and implementation, and for us today, that means research, can only improve the outcome. In fact, I'd say that MEPA calls on us not just to involve positive people as tokenistic participants in research once the study's been designed and funded, but it calls upon us to involve positive people in setting the research agenda, in study design, in the interpretation of results. And so MEPA holds out the possibility of a research agenda that focuses on what's relevant to the lives of positive people, on research that's acceptable to positive people, and on research findings that are more effective and more legitimate. And that's important because we know that when people are involved in ensuring their own well-being, success is more likely. And when research finds uh, something that's uncomfortable, then having people with HIV involved can help you frame it sensitively and uh, communicate it. So involving positive people in research about positive people is good. And as I'll argue today, involving positive people in research about HIV prevention is also good and necessary. So HIV positive people have a history of involvement in research. We wouldn't know what we do about HIV without them. It's because positive people participated in research, even though they knew research would not benefit them personally, that we're now in a position where the end of HIV transmissions is a possibility. So HIV activism in Australia occurred on the back of an already established gay rights movement. The early HIV activists used a familiar combination of strategies, visible process, protest and forming alliances, particularly with those engaged in HIV related research. Nothing About Us Without Us was a rallying cry that ensured affected communities were involved and that biomedical research uh, was translated in ways that community members could understand. And arguably, the HIV sector still leads the way in community and academic research partnerships. Accustomed as we are to it now, there was a time when this was hugely radical. Scientists and doctors consulted non-clinical people on consulting non-clinical people on the process of a clinical trial. Well, there was just no way that that was done before HIV activists insisted on it. It wasn't done because people didn't think of it, but because academia, science and medicine, these are exclusive circles. And people in these circles are afforded a level of credibility and authority that others just aren't. And people don't generally, generally wake up one morning and decide to share that authority around. Or if they do, their institutions or their funders aren't necessarily well set up to allow for it. But at the same time, there's always been activists who are also researchers, scientists or doctors, and many of them have been crucial as bridge builders. So in short, HIV changed a lot of things, but we need to remember that discussion on good practice models for working together or meaningful involvement of people living with HIV in research, or indeed things like uh, this presentation that I'm doing today, are still on many levels a discussion about politics and power sharing. So the next thing I want to talk to you about is a growing, what I perceive as a, a growing HIV invisibility across a number of areas. So in Australia, there's a growing group of people living longer with HIV, and each one of them has a growing list of medical conditions, and each condition brings with it additional complexity. And some would argue that that has made positive people less visible, since what was once life-threatening is now understood as a chronic manageable disease. So successful management of HIV has enabled positive people to move out of the activist mode. And even though the reality of that is largely good, so treatment is safer, it works better, and uh, even prevents onward transmission, new concerns are emerging. Living longer with HIV is no picnic, and some persistent areas of concern, like stigma and discrimination, are still being experienced even in healthcare settings. I'm particularly interested in this slow invisibilization of HIV and of positive people. At the policy level, HIV, which used to be the main game in town, is now positioned within a suite of responses to other bloodborne viruses. For example, the national BBV and STI strategies are meant to, and I would argue that they still broadly do, generally reflect concerns that have emerged from the community level. But there's increasingly a pressure to find synergy across the BBV and STI strategies so that they can be merged into one strategy. Now, in that scenario, HIV would be just 
part of a single strategy in which it would have to compete for attention and for funding. I also suspect that HIV invisibility is happening out there in the real world, not just as a result of better health outcomes for positive people as they age, or policies of synergy, but also as a result of the introduction of PrEP and U equals U. And I want to come back to that shortly. So research, I think, uh, is more of a mixed bag, but I still see signs of invisibilization in research. And it's perhaps to be expected that the recent research agenda has been really focused on prevention. And alongside that, there's been a general sort of quietism following from the understanding of post art HIV as a chronic manageable illness rather than as an early death sentence. So often in presentation of the story of HIV treatments and um, people with HIV in research in particular, there's a temptation to describe a kind of linear progression of increasing numbers of positive people commencing treatment, of adherence getting better and more and more people achieving an undetectable viral load. But what that disguises is the reality of those lives and what's actually going on. So adherence, for example, is not just something that happens, it's a struggle, it's a daily challenge, uh, it's a thing that positive people have worked incredibly hard to achieve. And in addition, that story of always edging closer to a 95% target suggests that once we hit that target, we've won and we can all go home. But the reality is, is from the moment that we end HIV transmissions, we have at least 30 years of work to do. And we need to know what that looks like for positive people in a world where HIV transmissions have ended. The good news is that despite my pessimism, the past few years have shown that the involvement of people with HIV in research remains really high. There are several examples of POS-led community research and initiatives, such as the W3 project, NAPL's involvement in the way that HIV surveillance is undertaken in Australia and reported, and the HIV Health Literacy Framework project. So fundamentally, uh, meaningful involvement, where am I actually? Uh, comes down to mutual respect, mutual responsibility for research outcomes and a willingness to share power and control. In a research context, that means involving positive people in studies about them at the earliest possible opportunity and sharing power and control of the study with them all the way through to the shaping of the way that study findings are presented uh, as co-authors. And one of the key areas in which positive people can contribute to research in the inter is the interpretation of findings. So data doesn't speak for itself and uninterpreted data is really dangerous for the positive community because third parties like the media can then interpret it in ways that create stigma. So data needs to be interpre interpreted and positive people can help frame that. Traditionally in Australia, uh, people with HIV have in, been involved in research as participants where they've shaped study outcomes by contributing their insights and their lived experience and that's good and that's necessary. But what's better than that and what really is a success of the Australian experience is where positive people are involved in positions like peer research associates on steering committees, uh, community advisory bodies and as co-investigators on research initiatives. And here I really have to acknowledge the work of people like Dr Ali Carter and others uh, at the Kirby. So, However, in involving HIV positive peers on research advisory bodies, it, it does come with a price tag. Uh, the health related challenges that positive people regularly experience can inhibit their ability to engage and participate. And that means research needs to be flexible and we need to find ways uh, to accommodate this. Um, researchers uh, are, are so patient with organisations like NAPWA uh, because of uh, capacity issues and we, we really appreciate that. Capacity building is required to give positive people skills to contribute and some of that capacity building happens through engagement with community organisations like NAPWA, but much of it like training in ethics can really only come <clears throat> from research. There can be a mistrust of researchers and not necessarily because positive people think that researchers have nefarious intentions, but because they feel that researchers might not understand their experience and could misrepresent it. Or that the desire to know something is so prioritized in research, the consequences and desirability of knowing might not get an appropriate consideration before dangerous information is unearthed. And here I'm thinking of research that involves things like the phylogenetic analysis of samples of HIV. But I, I have to note here that I'm a convert. Originally, I thought that this was incredibly concerning and that we shouldn't do it. But I've been helped to a place of better understanding by people like Jonathan King and Rebecca Guy that this research is safe research. But I have to admit, it took a while and that tells us something. I'm a connected, educated, interested, reasonably health literate, literate person. And for those people who don't have the opportunity to drive Jonathan and Rebecca around the bend with questions, how do those people reach a position uh, of better understanding? So trust in researchers 
is built by valuing the pos positive participation and comprehensively uh, addressing community concerns. Participants need to be protected from out adverse outcomes, not just by stopping the adverse outcomes, but by knowing what to do when the adverse outcomes occur. And uh, another limitation is the difference between the individual positive voice and the representative positive voice. So there's a temptation, I think, to consult one positive person or a couple of positive people, often very health literate sector connected people, and to tick off the consultation with community box. And NAPA would argue that that kind of consultation ignores the experience of experiences of less well connected, more marginalized people with HIV, and it's not really meaningful participation, which is why NAPA would say that incorporating multiple HIV positive voices into study design, that's really to be welcomed, but that representative voices in particular should be sought out. And what I mean by that is positive people who by virtue of their position or their work or their connections have the ability and the accountability and the responsibility to be able to speak on behalf of sections of the HIV positive community. So I, I recognise that that's really challenging and that it's resource intensive, but if we succeed in uh, building that capacity, then positive people have a lot to offer research, and that includes their lived experience, which is incredibly valuable, their bodies and their samples, and their view on what's relevant and their view on what's not. And I rather optimistically entitled my presentation today beyond the meaningful involvement of positive people in research. And I didn't at that moment have a particularly well thought through idea of what I meant by beyond. But between then and now, I've given it a fair bit of thought and I've had a number of discussions with my HIV positive colleagues about it. And I can uh, confidently now report that in this context beyond uh, the meaningful involvement is two or maybe three things. So firstly, it's embedding MEPA so deeply within the fabric of HIV related research that positive engagement happens automatically. Second, it's increasing the opportunities that positive people have to influence the setting of the research agenda and not just being involved in research, but actually involved in saying what should be researched. And thirdly, there should be a way to incorporate the informal research that we do, which I'll talk about in a bit, into the formal research agenda. So I should just make a note there on setting the agenda because I know that's a really big ask. And uh, Carla Trelaw once said to me that even researchers don't set the agenda. Researchers submit proposals and funders are the ones that select the projects that will be resourced. And that's right. But there are, I think, are ways in which positive people can and should influence the research agenda. So like NAPWA did with the ATRAS study, we can identify areas that need further study and partner with research centres to get those funded. And sometimes we even fund those things ourselves with generous contributions from the research centres, of course. Um, when things aren't relevant or acceptable, positive people can let you know and you can take those things off the agenda. And NAPWA can and does often ask for more research about gaps that we identify in the response. But my point is, and, and I submit, that our response to HIV would be improved by creating more opportunities for more positive input into the setting of the research agenda. So, Um, so the, these slides are just a few examples of the kinds of research that we do at NAPWA, uh, which I'll come on to in just a moment. So the things that we use research for at NAPWA are for policy change, uh, for designing campaigns and for health promotion. So I can't understate how crucial research is to these areas of work. Futures has been the catalyst for so many pieces of our work, things like our Good Quality of Life campaign or our Stigma and Resilience report or our work on ageing with HIV. And without the ATRA study uh, and subsequent reports, there's just no way that we would have been able to get such a successful outcome after all of these years fighting for treatment for Medicare ineligible people. As part of that uh, advocacy push, the Commonwealth Government required from us heaps and heaps of information about the scale of the issue and the cost of the solution. And much to my relief, all of that work had already been done because of the work that we'd done uh, on Medicare ineligibles. And here I need to shout out to Cathy Petuminous for her extraordinary and ongoing efforts on that project. So the Kirby surveillance data is incredibly important to us as well. It guides the development of programs, say to reach out to marginalised populations of positive people that need health literacy support. It supports the work that we undertake for the Commonwealth Government and even the gaps in surveillance help us understand where our blind spots are and to plan work to shine a light onto them. The Stigma Indicators Project at the Centre for Social Research in Health and some 
uh, very welcome support from Carla. It's helping us understand how to best tackle stigma and if something like a national stigma campaign is a safe and effective use of our resources. So uh, the last example I'll give here is that legal research and a series of freedom of information requests allowed us to produce the report which highlighted the overuse of mandatory testing laws across various Australian jurisdictions. And that's a really important way that we hold governments to account and we soften authoritarian laws, uh, or we try to, when they're being reviewed. And that's happening right now in New South Wales. So we use research to inform our work and to advocate for beneficial change. But we also undertake research ourselves. We do what you might call community based or community initiated or community led pieces of research. Um, an example of that is last year during the COVID uh, lockdown, um, we initiated a MailChimp survey and we had over 140 respondents to that within two weeks. And what we were trying to do was find out how COVID and the lockdowns were affecting positive people. And um, Napa would call that researching in our community. And what we're, we, we were able to uncover with our much effort, we can then feed into more formalized research and health promotion activities. So the point that I'm trying to make there is that anecdotal, non-ethics approved, community-led research can let you really quickly tap into trends that the community knows about, but that you can't see yet in other uh, data. And in the past, communities identified issues, things like weight changes, treatment breaks, lipodystrophy, just to name a few, significantly before they became apparent to the rest of the sector. And so what I think we should consider is how we legitimise that kind of research and find ways of using it as a guide to possible areas of future, more formal research. Uh, so the next thing I want to talk to you about is refining the HIV prevention narrative. So we need to find, refine the narratives we have around HIV prevention and arguably the research that we do on prevention and elimination. So I should start out uh, my argument here by saying that uh, positive people have always played a central role in HIV prevention through educating others about HIV prevention and HIV transmission, by using risk reduction strategies to prevent onward transmission and importantly, and most visibly in the era, era of treatment as prevention through the promotion and uptake of antiretroviral therapies, which is now not only an act of self-care, but one that is protective of sexual partners. So elimination of HIV is just not possible without all positive people being involved in ongoing prevention efforts, not just tangentially, but centrally. The NAPWA Start the Conversation campaign launched over 10 years ago, and that was the first campaign to state that treatment could protect your partners. And since then, our positive organisations have seen HIV positive people championing those messages. It goes without saying that HIV positive people do readily embrace their role in prevention work. But in Australia, the timeline that we faced uh, necessarily, I think I would argue, truncated the focus of our prevention, of our uh, uh, the focus on prevention aspects of HIV treatment. First, we had the Swiss statement, which suggested that positive people on treatment with an undetectable viral load couldn't pass on HIV. And then we had the Melbourne Declaration, which asserted that HIV transmissions could be reduced in Australia through large scale treatment uptake. <clears throat> excuse me. Then after the results of the START study were published, we succeeded in having the CD4500 cell restriction for prescribing of HIV medications removed, and then treatment rates started to rise significantly in Australia. And it was also then that our organisation started to uniformly promote the treatment as prevention messaging and to support treatment uptake for all positive people. However, as soon as that had started, PrEP became an urgent issue, which quite understandably required all of our attention and resources. And that new emphasis on PrEP sidelined treatment as prevention. So treatment as prevention and later U equals U messaging has, hasn't in Australia been the subject of sustained information campaigns like we've seen in other countries like Canada and the UK. And here I'm thinking of that wonderful can't pass it on campaign from the Terence Higgins Trust in Britain. So my hypothesis here is that this contributed to a good understanding of treatment as prevention and U equals U amongst many positive people, but a lower level of understanding about these things amongst the HIV negative population. And I'm not alone in that hypothesis, having had some considered and lengthy conversations with my positive colleagues in preparation for my presentation today. So my submission is that we should refine our U equals U and PrEP messaging to specifically articulate that these new technologies allow HIV negative people and HIV positive people to have safer and anxiety free sex with each other, 
we want zero harmony and not zero division. So it might be a bold message to state that out loud, saying PrEP is specifically for having sex with your HIV positive partners, and U equals U is specifically for having sex with your HIV negative partners. But by saying that out loud, I hope we can start to undermine the stigma that's still evident in our community about having sex with someone who's HIV positive. In research, that means that we need to know with more precision how much of a contribution treatment is making or has made to reducing the incidence of HIV transmission. We also need to know if refining or tweaking these messages can actually reduce stigma, and it means we need to know more about how treatment as prevention and U equals U and PrEP are interacting, what conversations are being had by people who rely on these technologies. And I'm worried because I think that PrEP and U equals U TASP negate the, the need to have conversations about status and um, what that does is invisibilize uh, positive uh, people. So previously where you would have people disclose status or disclose that they were uh, on PrEP or wanted to use a condom, those conversations are not happening anymore. I, I, would, I would submit. So uh, gaps, right. So this year, we'll, we'll see the 40th anniversary of the first diagnosis of HIV in Australia. And 40, if I remember correctly, is the age when younger and more interesting entrants onto the scene start to get more attention than you. And I'm worried that that's happening to HIV. I don't want governments in particular to get distracted with COVID and to lose interest before we get to HIV elimination. So lately, my mind's been obsessed with what we need to do to end HIV and where the gaps in our understanding are. So the first gap I want to highlight is in our understanding of the estimated nearly 6,000 people in Australia who still have a detectable viral load. The 2019 cascade estimates that there's about 3,000 positive people who are undiagnosed who remain undiagnosed. An additional 1,000 people roughly are diagnosed but not connected to care. And then there's an additional just over 1,000 people who are connected to care but not on treatment. And then another 676 people are on treatment but have a detectable viral load. And so that raises a number of questions for me that I think are fascinating and really mysterious. The first is, how do we have 3,000 undiagnosed people with HIV in Australia, but only 800 to 900 new transmissions a year? And I wonder if the estimate might be higher than the actual number. But if that's the case, then we really need to know that because the target when the targets in the strategy go up to 95%, the undiagnosed population will need to fall to about 1,500. So we need to know more about those 3,000 uh, and who they are and why we can't reach them before we can hit that new 95% target. And secondly, 974 people diagnosed but not retained in care. Is that loss to follow up? Are they interstate arrivals being double counted? Uh, is there a way of finding that out? And thirdly, and of particular interest to me and to NAPWA, is why we have 1100 odd people in care but not on treatment if they're connected to care then surely we must be able to find out where are they are they unwilling to treat if so are they being helped to a place of willingness by their healthcare providers is cost still a factor or is something else going on and finally i wonder about the 676 people on treatments but with a detectable viral load in a country like australia with all of our treatment options and quality of care and i wonder if we can do better I'm perfectly willing to accept that that's normal, that's as good as it gets, but not until we know more about that group. Are they adherent? Are they resistant and failing? Where are they? The other gap I want to flag up is stigma. We know that HIV stigma has not gone away, but we don't know much more. Has PrEP and U equals U reduced or reinforced stigma is the question that I think we need to answer. And finally, I have a question for community researchers as well, for community organisations as well as for researchers, and that is, what is the community and who participates in research? There's a kind of bias built into our organisations. Who engages with community organisations of research? Well, I would argue mostly metro, mostly white, mostly health literate, mostly sector connected, possibly mostly male people. And the moment you work in the sector, you become influenced by the dynamics and the pressures of the sector, and that makes you different to community. So I wonder if this bias is contributing to that und undiagnosed thing figure because the very person who would not engage with our organisations or would not participate in research, therefore would not have the opportunities to give us insights into why that's the case. So I hope I've articulated for you today why it's good to involve positive people in research and how that 
can improve our response to HIV. And just before I finish, I want to say a word of thanks to the HIV positive people who helped me organise my thoughts in preparation for today and contributed their own words to my presentation. I also want to thank the NAPWA staff for their assistance and especially, 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 I want to thank the researchers at the Centre for Social Research in Health, at the Kirby, at Arches and at the Australian Centre for HIV and Hepatitis Virology and Research. They involve NAPWA, they work with NAPWA, they put up with our lack of capacity and they support us to be better research partners. So I want to thank you thank them all for those efforts. So that's everything I have to say today, but I'm really happy to continue the conversation and take some questions if there are any. Great, thank you very much, Aaron. Um, so we do already have one question, so we'll get straight to that. Um, so this is from an anonymous person. So how does a reductionist approach to messaging address stigma and health literacy more broadly? If we are focusing on the work to achieve the 1990-90 targets in brackets non-MSM priority populations, doesn't this reductionist approach only reinforce stigma for those co for these cohorts? A reductionist approach to messaging. I wonder. I'm not quite sure what reductionist approach to messaging uh, means. But so maybe if I extrapolate a little bit on what I was talking about where I think that stigma might be um, happening or stigma might be reinforced is that um, U equals U messaging and PrEP messaging has the potential, I think, to do to either uh, reinforce stigma or to um, challenge it. And so we have a situation in which if our messaging essentially says um, I, I'm not saying that the only messaging around you equals your prep would be these things are specifically so that you can um, uh, engage in anxiety free sex across the zero divide. But I think that's one of the parts of the messaging that hasn't been there. So what we've seen is um, messaging around, for example, treatment as prevention uh, being around um, taking treatment for your own health and then one of the benefits is that you can't pass that on, but the main message is taking treatment for your own health, which I think was right for its time. But then with PrEP messaging, we've also seen uh, people taking PrEP to maintain their own sexual health. And in that uh, statement, positive people are excluded from the consideration of why you're taking PrEP, because you're taking PrEP to support your own sexual health, not so that you can have sex anxiety free, uh, with positive people. And in the reverse, when you're taking treatments to support your own uh, sexual health, the main focus is not on your ability to have anxiety free sex. So one of the things that I want to know more about is if PrEP and U equals U are stopping people uh, talking about status. And if that happens, then positive people become invisible in that scenario. Um, whereas previously, uh, we were encouraging people to um, make agreements within their relationships, to disclose status, to negotiate safer sex. I think those conversations might not be happening with the same regularity now. And that uh, means that in a way, positive people don't have to disclose their status. And that's great because it protects them from stigma. But it also means that because HIV because the discussion of HIV positive status is now invisible, um, when someone does disclose their status, that can they can then run into stigma and we're not doing anything in that conversation to, to challenge the stigma or undermine it. So I, I hope that answered the question. Yeah, some really interesting points um, there, Aaron. Um, and we do have some data sources that look at disclosure over time and to see how that's sort of changing. and. And I think it seems to be that in sort of different groups of men, you have some people who still disclose basically to everybody and then others who've basically just decided, I just don't need to do this at all anymore <laughs> on either either way, whether it's a prep user or, or a positive person with UVL. So it's a really, we're in a really interesting moment of flux there. <laughs> and look, I, I think that's perfectly understandable. Um, but I, I think that probably one of the things that I'd love to know more about that if there was more research is how we then uh, finding out more about what's happening there so that we can make sure that HIV doesn't become, or HIV positive status doesn't become totally invisible. Yeah, certainly. So another question here from Andrew. Um, so he says, great presentation, Aaron. We know that a large proportion of the undiagnosed and a large proportion of those with undetectable viral, viral load are recently arrived overseas born people. So how do researchers and NAPA respond to this fundamental change in the epidemic? 
Yeah, so um, NAPWA has been focusing for a few years now on trying to reach out to groups of positive people that are not um, the people that are traditionally connected to our organisation. Um, we're not uh, we're not sidelining the people that are traditionally connected to our organisation. We're trying to encourage more people to, to get connected and particularly to reach out to communities that we would perceive as more marginalised. Uh, and so um, our health literacy framework uh, is about establishing for particular groups um, what are the health literacy needs for those groups and then having focus groups within those groups so they can tell us how best they want to um, get access to that information. Uh, so we're hoping, uh, that, so that, that is essentially one of the ways that we're hoping to make inroads into communities of positive people that haven't traditionally been connected or stayed connected to organize, the positive organisations. Um, but uh, yeah, and, and so far it's going really well. I will get back to you at the end of this year, hopefully uh, with a big successful story of what the results of, of that work is. Mm -hmm. It is a really challenging area, obviously, that's um, kind of been on the agenda of the HIV sector now for several years. And these questions come up at you know the, the national conference almost every year now for the last few years about um, this change in the epidemic. Um, and the issues you raised in your presentation were really interesting about um, just that, that point of view of the very people who we're now most interested in finding out more about are the ones that probably aren't participating in your organisations or in research. So that's actually quite hard for us, even as researchers, to kind of get the people in um, that we need to tell us their stories. Um, it's, it can be a real challenge. I, I think, yeah, I think that's that's definitely right. And there is this, I think it could be worse than we think because um, while I look around the sector and I see some really good examples of, of uh, the positive organisations and, and the AIDS councils, for example, reaching out into those communities, um, I, I, worry because I, I think that people from those communities sometimes uh, can get in touch with our organisations, but I don't think they stay. And um, uh, and that could be good. That means they're just accessing the services they need. And then when they don't need those services anymore, they don't maintain their connection. But it would be really good to find out why that's happening, if that's happening, I suppose, is if I've identified something that's actually happening. And then um, why that's happening. And uh, yeah, I I I have I, I question whether or not sometimes in my more insecure moments I question whether or not organisations that were grow, that grew out of the early um, uh, HIV epidemic and were centred around um, certain communities can then transform themselves into communities that into organisations that need to access totally different communities and mm -hmm. so it's it's one of the things that I I think you know any research in that that space would just be absolutely useful really useful yes definitely. Um, so Tony Keller also uh, thanked you for a great presentation and asked a similar question about um, like the diversification of the epidemic. So I think you've kind of already covered that a little bit. So thanks, Tony. Um, this is from Ali. So again, great presentation, Aaron. Um, thanks for speaking with us today. I wonder if you could comment on the ethical tensions that are commonly raised by community-based research and the consequences these ethical implications have on people living with HIV who traverse multiple communities perhaps things researchers should be aware of and work to address in their work. Uh, the ethical, are we talking about community? Um, I'm not sure, are we talking about community-based research that, that I was talking about? So community-led research that when we, we do um, surveys with community, etc. cetera. Um, and th the issues that raise there is that those, those studies are not ever um, they don't, we don't get ethics approval, we don't go through those processes, but I feel very confident that the way that those studies are framed, because they're framed by a community and indeed they're led by a community, they're sensitively framed. They don't ask people to disclose their status or their identity, so, um, and they're voluntary. So, and, and then I think when we're getting results from that, um, we just need to bear in mind that those results can be indicative, but they're not. They, they they're not, and they shouldn't be presented as a as a scientific fact or or reality. But I, I guess my argument that I was that I was getting at there are that um, these are a useful mechanism to guide more more formal research that then goes through 
um, the, the ethical frameworks. And then if I talk about the more formal research that comes out of the research centres, um, some of the issues that I have been worried about in the past in terms of ethics are um, uh, is that whether or not research that that um, is being done can have a negative effect on uh, positive people and particularly I was very worried and uh, as I said I've, I'm a convert I've been I've been reassured that this is not going to happen but I was really worried that phylogenetic research would would eventually one day down the line be able to identify um, a kind of family tree of HIV in which you could identify individuals and perhaps you could identify the the direction of travel of, of HIV and so um, I, I worry in those circumstances when there is an increasing collection of data on individuals that even though on the individual study at the in in the individual moment we think that we've got all bases covered and everything's fine that one day we're going to have a situation in which um, say the coercive apparatus of the state realize that they can make connections subpoena information and criminalize um, positive people and so one of the things that I, I think would be really helpful for us to reassure community is that if uh, researchers had considered what happens in those moments. If that does happen, if there is a subpoena, um, what then happens? How do positive people afford um, um, legal representation? Can anything be done uh, to help them in those those situations? Or can we make data unsubpoenaable? I think I don't think we can, but yeah. 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 Um, I'm not sure about the uh, current phylogenetic work, but I'd certainly know that with the opposite to track study that we ran here at the Kirby in those years, we ensured that we had the HIV AIDS legal centre on board. We got so much legal advice. We made sure that we gave people opportunities to get that kind of free assistance and help if anything like that did end up happening. And thankfully, of course, it didn't. Um, but I think it is really important, like you say, for researchers to be thinking about those things. So we've got a question here from Fran um, saying, again, great talk, thanks. Do you have an idea of the proportion of those 3,000 undiagnosed that are recent infections or like the early stage of diagnosis? That may be more of a question for the surveillance people, but if you want to comment on that, Aaron, feel free. No, no, I, I don't. But um, look, after we got the 2019 data, I had a conversation with Sky, which was absolutely fascinating. And so I'm hoping that maybe we can, um, we can probe that data a little bit more and find out what's happening there. Yeah. And then one from Martin Holtz. So, um, a lot of early PrEP messaging and possibly U equals U messaging was about how easy PrEP on treatment or treatment is, deliberately avoiding things that remain difficult for everyone, such as discussion, negotiation, responding well to unexpected disclosure, etc. So not sure how comfortable organizations of all stripes feel about doing health promotion in these awkward or difficult areas of people's lives, but it probably is necessary for combination prevention and perhaps getting more necessary. Any comment on that, Aaron? I mean, I, th I think that's right. I, I think um, I I think that we have an opportunity to look. Actually, no. I need I uh, I would need this to be confirmed by researchers. But I have a submission. I would uh, I have an, uh, a theory that I think we have an opportunity to use prep and U equals U to really land some blows on stigma. But I think we're going to have to pin our colours to the flag. Um, we're going to have to say uh, this is. Um, uh, these tools, these technologies have a purpose and that purpose in the case of U equals U, not so much treatment as prevention in terms of the messaging, but U equals U. U equals U exists so that you can have uh, anxiety free sex with your HIV negative partners. And I think we need to be really explicit about saying that. And uh, the same for PrEP. I think PrEP exists so that you can have sex with your HIV positive partners or people that don't know that they are positive, but you definitely don't need PrEP to have sex with other negative people. So I think that we should be um, a bit more bolshy about saying that. Okay, potentially controversial there <laughs> in the sense that I think um, one, I suppose, little caveat to that would be that even a lot of people who believe themselves to be negative may not actually be negative. And so if it, that's why we've found with much research on Sarah sorting over the years that while it is more effective than not using any strategy, it's not what we'd particularly call a safe strategy. I mean, no, this is neg neg Sarah sorting I'm talking about. Yes. Oh, and look, I absolutely agree. And I'm not suggesting that these messages should be the only messages. Um, so so I, I wouldn't be, I mean, look, I, I would, uh, I would think that you wouldn't be talking about um, using uh, PrEP as a technology to zero to zero sort. You're going to be using PrEP 
daily treatment. It, that's not what's going to happen. But I think as part of a suite of messages, um, it might be good to, to talk about the implications for your HIV positive partners. So. And what I'm trying to do there, just so that people understand my thought process, what I'm trying to do there is I'm trying to keep uh, uh, positive status and positive people visible in the conversation about HIV prevention. Great. Um, it looks like we don't have any more questions coming up. Um, so unless people hurriedly want to write something down very, very quickly in the next couple of minutes, we may just end it there. So and that's fine. We can have a bit of an early mark. So thank you so much, Aaron. It's it's always great to um, hear you speak. Very eloquent. You have some really, really interesting perspectives. And um, as as I've said before, with this seminar series, it's um, we really love it when we can get people, community leaders, coming along and speaking to us, so that we can just hear those views, strengthen that really, really strong partnership that we already have. But really, I suppose, give give that opportunity to community leaders to kind of just um, get on their soapbox and say whatever they think <laughs> about research. So we really, really appreciate your time today, Aaron. Thank you so much for that great presentation. Thank you so much for having me. And can I uh, just say, I hope you know the so when you said be as controversial as you want. I hope I've, I've met the requirement. Um, but yeah, look, it's been really great to come along and I'm really happy to come back whenever you want me. So that's that's fantastic. Thank you. Great. Thanks, everyone. Um, and I think we don't have a seminar on next week. Uh, we've got the break because of Easter and everything. And then after that, the week after, obviously, we've got our fabulous um, Anthony Fauci, uh, David Cooper lecture. So please make sure you sign up for that. Thanks, everyone.